Yes, we are now live on Facebook. Got it. Yeah, so we are now live on Facebook. We we will start once I get some uh, quorum. Because 10 has not reached. Okay. So for, I am seeing someone has joined, one person. Thank you for joining the uh, Azola webinar. We have not started. We are waiting for participants to join. So share the live stream to your friends, to your colleagues, so that they join. Let me also share. I'm also sharing the live stream to my friends. Yeah. So Karibuni Sana, we have not started. We are waiting for people to join. So thank you so much for joining. You're in the right place. Today we are going to learn about Azola. So just wait for the time so that we start. Yes, Yes, Uh, Alafu, I go in presentation mode, so it was small. Uh, I hope you don't quit me. What is it doing again? Uh, not yet. You know, on the last page. Because I was at us. Sasa, end up a slide show, and then in the section, you made a slide show. That will do. Up on your left, just move on your left. There's a slide show up. And then there, right, song the right, song the two. Then, the less written slideshow just up on Juju. There was a place to report to the click up. Uh, yeah, you let the click. Click to. Because I was really. Uh, no, still not. Uh, uh, not yet, not yet. To know number it was small, still quite small. Happened there. Mahapo? Uh, I know it's quite small. From my end, it's full screen. Mm, uh, from my end, it's not. But uh, don't worry, let me call the mommy up and jump. How old Anything? No, 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 something, but it's small, it's not full screen. Let me call Can the... I stop sharing me and the tenor? Yeah. Let me stop sharing. I have stopped sharing. Now, let me start sharing.
You'll tell me if you can see it now. Inko Sawa, Apo Sawa. Sawa, perfect. Yeah, awesome. So we still have time. Let's give people five minutes and then yeah. we start at 10.05. All right. Yeah, so for those who have joined, you're in the right place. The um, Kenya is privileged to have Grace Misoy, who is going to take us through the topic of Azola and how you can use it to cultivate for animal feeds. So Karibu Sana, we have not started. We will start at 10 or five. So five minutes and then we start. For those who have joined on Facebook, please tell us where you're joining from. Please just chat us on Facebook. I see we have uh, ADS Western joining us on our Zoom. Thank you so much for joining. You are in the right place. Do you mind introducing yourself so that you know who has joined? You can just unmute and stop. We don't mind. Introduce yourself. He's saying his name is Stephen. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us. Yeah, so for the people joining us on Facebook, please continue to share the live stream, share it to your page, share it to your friends, share it to your colleagues, because everyone needs to learn about Azola, <laughs> the new way of cultivating for animal feeds. Um, we have two minutes and then we start. For those who have joined, thank you for joining. Please share the live stream to your friends, to your colleagues, so that they join us and learn about Azola. We have people online. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank you for joining. We have not started. We are going to start in two minutes. Let me do a shout out. We have uh, one boy Kiremi from Kilimangogo Machakos. Thank you so much for joining. We have Esther from SEF Eldoret. Esther Waveru, thank you. We have Eunice Wekesa from Kitale. Thank you. Actually, I'm in Kitale. Look for me. In me. We have Nancy Teriki from Eldoret. Thank you so much for joining. We have Elizabeth Marunga from GPAC. Thank you for joining. Yeah, if you want me to read out your name, just uh, chat us on Facebook and I'm going to shout out for you. Yeah, people are still joining. Thank you so much. I see Sylvia Muteo from Machacos. Thank you for joining. Yeah. So I think we now have uh, 
um, forum online and of course on Zoom. So let me start recording and then we now officially start. Uh, let me start recording. So my name is Ratemo Morath. I work for Pelam Kenya. And today we are here to learn about Azola cultivation for animal feeds. And this is through the project for KCOA, Knowledge Hub for Organic Agriculture for Eastern Africa. And one of our guest speaker is a master trainer. Her name is Grace Misoy. She's going to introduce more about herself and where she works. So thank you so much for joining. We are all here to learn. So please give her a chance to just go through the presentation and tell us about Azola and how we can start it. And then after, we're going to have a Q&A session. If you have questions, she's here to answer. So Grace Kaributana, so I now hand over the mantle to you to take us through the two-hour session. Thank you. Thank you, Ratemo. And uh, good morning, everyone. As you've heard from Ratemo, my name is Grace Misoy. I am a farmer, first of all. I do organic farming and uh, I don't do it because it is done. I do it because it's a passion and it's a way of life. I am also a master trainer under the KCOA project and I'm also the director of Advocacy for Change Foundation. Let me mention Advocacy for Change in a bit. So ACF is a non-governmental organization that works towards restoring wholeness and we work to ensure that there is an environment that people work in harmony with nature and also with God. We are based in Eldoret, western part of Kenya, and we work in uh, seven counties, basically in the western part of Kenya. So we cut across the arid and semi-arid areas to the um, highlands. I'm so humbled to be a speaker in this session today, and we shall be talking about Azola. In, um, in a nutshell, livestock production has been the main source of income of most households in Kenya, and the main challenge has been feeds, and especially the concentrates. As you've realized, uh, what we get from our livestock compared to what we put in at times do not even break even. So we've opted to finding ways that we can cut down on cost of production. And one way is by producing or cultivating Azola, which will help us in um, a number of, um, in supplying a number of nutrients as we shall see when we, as we proceed in the training. We are also not just looking at a, uh, at the big livestock. We are also looking at the small animals like chicken and how Azola can be of benefit. It is also worth noting that um, technology has come to help us make our lives better and improve on our pockets as well. Therefore, I welcome all of us, those who are following us live on Facebook and those who are part of this Zoom meeting as we go through this process. But remember, we are learning all of us. So I'm looking forward to a very engaging session whereby I'll hear from you as you hear from me. This is the exchange of knowledge. So at the end of the day, I'm expecting that I should have learned from you and you will have learned from me. Karibu sana. So, uh, uh, in this session, we shall be covering the following contents. So by the end of the training, we'll have talked about the introduction to Azola. We will have looked at the structure of Azola. We will look at the economic value of Azola. This is in relation to the nutrients that we get from Azola. We will also look at the requirements for us to cultivate Azola. We will also look at the cultivation and the steps of Azola culture. Finally, we will look at the limitations of Azola culture. 
because really every coin has two sides and we are not shy from talking about the other side. So we look at the limitations of Azola and then we'll have a session on question and answer. Let us walk together this journey. So let me introduce Azola. Azola has several names. Some would call it a duckweed, others mosquito fan, others water fan, but all the same, it is an aquatic plant that grows rapidly, double their volumes in just two days, and it belongs to Sylvana Sea family. As you've seen, it grows rapidly, doubling its volume in only two days. That should tell you this is a very fast growing aquatic plant. It is also worth noting that it grows in fresh water and is actually naturally available, mostly on moist soils, ditches, marshy ponds, and is widely distributed in the tropical belts of India. That is why it was first adopted in India before the rest of us thought of doing the same. So actually, for those of you who come from areas where uh, we have uh, marshy ponds, you should have seen this growing naturally or wild in the natural ecosystem. So actually, it's not something new. It's only that we are domesticating it for our own uh, benefit. Uh, we are not supposed to get into a lot of science, but I'm also aware that we are being followed by students and those who are still continuing their studies or want to pursue their studies further. So let me allow me to talk about the taxonomy of Azola. So its kingdom is plantae, division is um, teritophyta, their class is polypodiopsida, the order is Palvinales, family, Salvin Salvinaceae, and genus is Azola. And at that point, we have several types of Azolas, as we shall see as we progress. Now, allow me to talk about the economic value of Azola, because unless we know this, we will not have even interest to continue with uh, the training. I have shared a table on your screen. I hope you can see. And this is uh, basically based on a dry weight. So the following chemical composition is available in Azola. First, we have nitrogen at 5%. We have phosphorus at um, half a, uh, 0.5%. We have potassium ranging from 2 to 4.5%. We have calcium, 0.1 to 1%. We have magnesium, 0.65%. We have manganese, 0.16%. We have iron, 0.26%. We have crude fat, that is 3 to 3.3%. We have sugars, 3.4 to 3.5%. We have starch, 6.5%. We have chlorophyll, 0.34 to 0.55%. And uh, ash at 10%. From this table, it is worth noting that apart from being a feed, that supplies a lot of nutrients, it is also a good source of uh, nutrients to our crops. Therefore, you can also use Azola for your teas, for, for your fermented teas, you can use uh, Azola. It will, you will take advantage of all these nutrients that are rarely found in a single plant. So this is very important. And I want to insist that apart from feeding our livestock, our animals on Azola, we can also use Azola to make our plant teas.
So for you to grow a Zola, there are things that are basic. These are the requirements that you must have for you to start up cultivation of Azola. As I said, it is an aquatic plant. Therefore, water is mandatory. And uh, not just water, we need fresh water. I have indicated 10 to 15 centimeters in the multiplication pond. Adequate water level in the main pond is around four inches. So water is mandatory. It is also very important for us to have the right temperatures. And I've indicated that uh, day and night ranges between 32 to 30 degrees. These are most favorable. But for a luxurious growth of Azola, temperatures should be 23 to 30 degrees centigrade. Meaning at those temperatures, I am calling it luxurious because it will grow without any hassle and you're not supposed to even add any nutrients when the temperatures are right and you started with the, night, the right nutrients as you laid your pond. The other thing is light is also very important for Azola, but also not that it should be partial shade. So you can put your structure under a tree or you can use the shade net, but always ensure that it is getting enough light. On humidity, it has to be really humid at 85 to 90%. Uh, on soil pH, Azola grows well in slightly acidic soil. So if your soils are not acidic, then you need to ensure that you improve on that to at least 5.2 to 5.8. Other stock of even seven pH, but anywhere from five, it will work. Nitrogen, it is also important that you note that Azola is nitrogen fixing fan and does not require nitrogenous fertilizers for its growth. We are told that you can use phosphorus 20 kgs per hectare. This is a big area. If you are to construct a pond or ponds covering um, an hectare, then it will take you 20 kgs. This is good for this is desirable for good biomass production. Because at the end of the day, what we want in Azola is the biomass. So it's important for us to consider supplying enough uh, phosphorus for us to get the right, um, the right uh, biomass. I hope we are together. Can I get a shout out from anyone for me to be sure that we are together? Maybe somebody can comment. I might not be able to see, but I know Ratemo is there. Ratemo, I hope people are following. So yeah, we I'm have. Speaking to myself. We have 24 people live. We have okay. people here on Zoom. I'm seeing. We have Moses, Vivian. Say something. Are you following the uh, trainer? Yes, yes, yes you're yes, following Kinley. Thank you. At least I've heard people speak. Now I know we are together. Uh, moving to the next slide. Now I want us to work together because now this is the step-by-step -step process in Azola cultivation. So the first one is pond selection. You need to select an area where you will construct your pond. And um, number one, I have said, it is important for you to place it near home for regular upkeep and monitoring. It is not a must, but you can do this for regular upkeep and monitoring. 
Although I've also seen farmers who've done this along the riverbank, but my problem with that is um, you're not able to monitor it uh, regularly. And as you will see as we proceed, uh, you need to make sure that it is purely organic. Sorry, organic is uh, in my mind all the time. I keep mentioning it. So you have to make sure that it is only Azola growing in that pond. And because the, the, we've, we've supplied everything that is necessary for growth, any other aquatic plant could even grow in that pond. So it is important for you to keep it in a place that you can really monitor it. So if, it is, uh, if you're doing it along the riverbank, then at least ensure that you are always inspecting that pond. Also, it is important for you to place it near a regular water source. It could be uh, if you have a borehole, it's important for you to, to ensure that it is close or it's nearby. If you're also using um, uh, piped water, it is important that you place it uh, near that area. So it's important that it is uh, near a, a regular water supply. As I mentioned earlier, make sure that the place that you selected for your pond is under partial shade. What's, why are we talking about partial shade? Two reasons. One, it will minimize evaporation. Can you imagine during the dry season, if uh, your pond is uh, exposed to the light, you could be losing a lot of water. So to discourage that, make sure it is under partial shade. Probably if you placed your shade, uh, maybe you're using a, a shade net, as you can see in, one, in, in the photo, you can uh, place it on top and do not cover all the sides to ensure that uh, morning hours it's getting direct sunlight and in the evening. But during the day when the sun is very hot, it is under the sheet. So consider that. And I've also said that when it is partially shaded, it, can, it encourages growth. The other thing for you to consider is uh, the floor area of the pond should be free from any sharp areas or objects to avoid breaking of liners that might cause leakage. Here, I'm talking about uh, maybe you're constructing your pond in a place where there are uh, rocks. So ensure that the surface is, uh, the surface is free from any sharp object. Because uh, come to think of it, you've bought a dam liner, but then within a very short time, it has been uh, bricked by sharp objects. That will cause leakage. And trust me, if you lost your water, and if you're not there to always monitor, be assured that you will lose all the crop. So it's important to make sure that the area is flat. Now let us get, uh, you've cleared, you've found the area, you've selected the right area for your pond. The next thing that needs to happen is now construction of the pond. So pond size will depend on the number of species that you want to culture or the supplement requirement that you need in your farm or still availability of resources. So if you need, uh, if, you, if, if your need is um, like five kgs per day for the supplements, then that means you need to, to get a, a bigger pond. But for our case, I'm going to use four by six as our standard pond size. Therefore, for any smallholder farmer, you can do a four by six feet pond, which is enough to produce around a kg of uh, supplement every day. So if you have your cows, one kg is enough. Because when I talk of uh, smallholder farmers, I'm talking about that farmer who has uh, two to three, maybe four cattle. 
So one kg will be enough to supplement for that. So four by six pound will be enough. So if you need more than that, you can always play around the figures. Because if this is for one kg, then if I need five kgs, I'll just multiply by five and I'll get, or I can actually work on small pawns of this size, several of them. The other thing is um, the selected area should be cleared and leveled. So the walls of the pond can either be made of bricks or raised embankment made from the excavated soil. So I have said um, the pond is four by six feet. So the soil that comes from there can be used to raise the embankment. Also, the pond can be lined. Although I've seen farmers who are doing this in ponds that are not uh, lined, especially those who do this along the riverbanks and in areas where the soils are, are clay, so it's able to, to stand. The other thing is uh, secure all the sites pro properly using bricks. You can, if you've lined, so for the liner to stay well, ensure that you're securing all the sites. So in other words, once you've laid your, your liner, you can place some bricks inside to ensure that the liner is held tightly to the wall. Uh, as you walk on your pond, I'm imagining that maybe you bought some, uh, you bought some, uh, what do we call, some seed, as well as seeds from maybe another farmer. And what you did is you've been raising or multiplying your seed, maybe in a container or something. And now you're able to, you have enough for your pond. So you, you inoculate the pond and you cover with a net to prevent debris from falling to the pond. As I said, we just want to ensure that in inside that pond, we have water, a bit of, of a, a cow dung that we've placed in there and a zola and nothing else. So that when you are harvesting to feed our animals on, we are not collecting plus the leaves and any other thing that um, may have uh, fallen to the, to the pond. Now, once your pond is ready, always ensure that you seam fertile soil. So good soil, fertile soil, but ensure that you sieve the soil to ensure that any material, any, any big material that could even float on the pond is removed. And then mix your soil with cow dung, water, and spread uniformly in the pond. I've also indicated that biogas larry can also be used instead of cow dung. Actually, the slurry could be the best because it is uh, kind of refined, so it's soft. It doesn't have any debris, so it will be fine and it can mix well with water. So the depth of water should be four to six inches. Ensure that uh, the water you're putting to the, to the pond gets to four to six inches. After that, a kg of Azola culture will be put in that pond. So as I said, four by six feet pond will require a kg of Azola. So if your pond is bigger than this, you can always work with that figure. I hope we are together. Yes, even online I'm seeing comments that we are together and they're following very close. Perfect. 
Perfect. We can continue now. Uh -huh. Now, I hope you can all see that um, font. It, it doesn't have to be very complicated. It can be as simple as it can get. And it can also be as, um, uh, as complicated as it can also get. But uh, if you look at that structure, it has been lined by a dam liner in a very simple way that any farmer can do this. Of course, your structure can be better than this, but we are sharing what farmers are doing. This is um, a point from one of our farmers. And therefore, uh, it is possible to use such kind of uh, a dam, a, a pond. So for us to maintain this pond, we need to add nutrients to the pond at least every two to three weeks. But it will also depend on your production. Some farmers would uh, put enough uh, nutrients when they start and their production is uh, a bit slow or you're not harvesting regularly. So if you're not harvesting regularly, that means that uh, consumption of the nutrients will be quite low. So you can even stay to a whole month before adding nutrients. The other thing is any litter or aquatic plants should be removed regularly. I mentioned this earlier that uh, because uh, uh, we have other aquatic plants that can grow in such ponds, it is important for you to ensure that uh, your pond is free from those aquatic plants. It needs to be a pure stand of azola. Basically, the reason is you could be, the other uh, aquatic plants could be poisonous for, for, let's say, for a poultry. So we don't want to risk the health of our livestock in the process. So we have to ensure that any aquatic plant that is growing there is uh, removed. The other thing is, the pond needs to be emptied once in every six months. And the cultivation started with new soil and new azolla culture. So the pond, you can work on your pond for a whole six months, meaning it can only be emptied twice a year. So it's quite convenient. It is not a lot of work. Any farmer can do this conveniently at the comfort of uh, the other work that they are doing. Because if it's twice a year, then you have enough time to produce. And finally, uh, empty the pond. This is to ensure that we are supplying uh, fresh nutrients and also to ensure that if there are other development of uh, um, other aquatic plants, maybe at the base, of your pond, we are able to get rid of them. Once uh, you've planted uh, your azola, we come to the point of harvesting and now feeding. After 10 to 14 days, the azola will cover the whole pond and uh, it can be harvested from the 15th Day. And I've indicated that this will depend on the quality of culture used, the climatic condition, and the nutrient level. So I have seen that uh, most farmers would get um, their azola culture from another farmer. And um, it is always very important that you get to harvest, you, you get the right. Uh, the mature azola for your seed. So if you get the, your, the mature azola for your seeds, what will happen is it will do well. But if you pick the, the smaller ones or the young ones, maybe three, four days old, it will take some time for it to establish. And 
also you'll not be uh, sure of the quality of your seed. So it is important to get a mature azola for your seeds. The other thing is when, uh, when the sun is too hot during the dry season, at times you find that uh, even the temperatures in the pond changes and this could affect the growth of um, azola. For example, those who may uh, opt for raised ponds, I'm advocating for the use of bricks because bricks will, uh, will kind of maintain the temperatures unlike those who would prefer cemented ponds. So the cemented ponds will cause, uh, there'll be a fluctuation of temperatures in the water and this would affect the growth of Azola. The other thing is of course, the nutrient level. If you've been using the same pond for over six months, then the production will come down. It is important that uh, after the six months, you empty the pond, start afresh. And uh, during these other periods, ensure that uh, you, add, uh, you add nutrients to the pond. For example, after harvesting, you can, um, you can add some slurry to your pond. This is to ensure that we are supplying nutrients for Azola. The other thing is Azola is harvested by scooping. You can even use your own, your own hands or use a plastic sieve. I have also seen farmers who have um, embraced the use of locally available materials like a shade net. You can make your own sieve from a shade net, especially if your pond is big, you can use a shade net. You make it in a way uh, that you're able to, to put a handle that is a, a long stick to enable you harvest Azola without necessarily getting into the pond. So you can use a plastic sieve, shade net, or just the common uh, nets, of course, I cannot say mosquito nets, but if they are old mosquito nets, you can also make your, your sieve from that. I am underlining old mosquito nets. The other thing is, Azola can be fed to livestock in fresh or dry form. So it can be fed directly or with other concentrates. Let me explain. So I can actually harvest my Azola from the pond and feed my chicken directly with that and feed my fish directly with that or dry or I dry them under the shade and feed my, uh, my, my fingerlings on that directly or I add to other concentrates. For example, if I'm feeding my cows with um, um, the other concentrates like uh, dairy meal, I can add to that. Or maybe we have farmers of, uh, of, uh, who use um, maize stovers to feed their livestock. You can add Azola to that or any uh, wheat straws or whatever you have for your livestock, you can add Azola to that and feed your livestock. The other thing that is important during harvesting is that Azola has to be cleaned thoroughly in clean water. This is to remove the cow dung smell. As I've mentioned severally, we use uh, slurry, in our, to, new, to supply nutrients to our ponds. And therefore the smell of cow dung will always be in that water. And of course, Azola will grow with that smell. So it's important that we rinse Azola thoroughly before we feed on our livestock. Or otherwise, our cows will not, especially will not enjoy Azola. The other important thing is for you to shade your pond, to prevent direct sunlight. 
I have mentioned this over and over again. It should tell you how important this is. And uh, the main reason is, if you leave it in direct sunlight, uh, your azolla will turn brownish, reddish in color, which of course will not be appealing even to the eyes of our livestock, but at the same time, it will lower nutrient levels. So please, this is very important. Shade your pond, prevent direct sunlight. Allow me to continue and then we will ask question. We are almost there. I know we'll have a lot of questions. So we'll answer questions at that uh, level. I said uh, from uh, that picture, I said uh, you don't necessarily have to have a liner to, for you to produce azolla. Uh, in wet areas, azolla can be grown, like what you see in that picture. But at the same time, it is important for you to note what other things are growing in that pond. If you see clearly, there are other water uh, aquatic plants that are growing in that pond. Also, you're not able to manage uh, your pond correctly if you allow it to be just that way. But of course, you can produce your azolla. I've seen most farmers would use such an area to culture their azolla. So, as I said before, everything that has uh, the positive side also has the negative side. And at this point, I want to share with you the limitations of Azola. One, water is prerequisite for Azola production. Therefore, no water, no Azola production. And this could be the main challenge that is experienced by farmers, especially uh, in the arid and semi-arid areas where they are not able to get uh, enough water. So the main limitation actually is um, water. And uh, unfortunately, we do not have uh, yet any technology of how to produce as well as using uh, less water. Although this is now an area that farmers can try, especially in the arid and semi-arid areas, but water is prerequisite. The other limitation is the extremely low temperature that is not suitable. So at times we are not able to control the temperatures, especially during uh, the rainy seasons, the temperatures can really go low and we have uh, no control over that. That is one of the limitations of, uh, of Azolla cultivation. The other limitation could be the initial cost, which is slightly high. I'm thinking of uh, the construction of that uh, pond. So you need, uh, it cannot be done by everybody. At least you, you will incur some costs in, uh, in producing azolla. And of course, uh, buying the seeds, most farmers would sell you 2,000 Kenyan shillings per kg. So it's quite expensive. And also, we cannot fail to talk about the ignorance of the importance of azolla. So at times, it's not necessarily that uh, it is difficult to produce Azola, but it is us not knowing the importance of Azola. Because I know some of you would be like, this crop has been, this aquatic plant has been here for the longest, and uh, we've never known it could be used for this. So those are some of the limitations of um, Azola. Uh, I want to, before I get to the reference, I want to mention how Azola, the type of animals that can, uh, that can use Azola. So I have mentioned fish and uh, for fish, I have actually seen farmers using uh, fish, feeding fish with uh, Azola. And especially for the fingerlings, 
it's important that uh, you can feed the uh, azolla directly, but it is also very, uh, it's more palatable for the fingerlings when you dry your azolla and uh, now feed them with that. Because once you dry them, you can uh, grind them to a finer form that can be easily uh, utilized by the fingerlings. That is one. You can also use your azolla for poultry. Poultry, all start with the, the hands, of course, the cheeks. You can use for, for quails. I don't know if I must still do quails, but those who do quails, you can use for your quails. You can use for your ducks. Maybe that is why it's called uh, the duckweed. You can use for your ducks. And for this, one important thing about use of Azola is uh, the formation of the egg. The yolk becomes a, a deep, rich yellow. So it improves on the color of the yolk. And uh, I've seen some farmers uh, trying to, to, to feed the Azola on uh, improved uh, breeds, chicken breeds to improve on the quality of the egg. So farmers who do poultry, this is for you. You can uh, do uh, azolla. And of course, you cannot just feed azolla. You will have to supplement azolla with other feeds. And for example, rural farmers who do not buy uh, uh, concentrates for their poultry, I've seen farmers who just uh, feed their chicken on uh, maize. You can now add azolla. It will balance all the nutri nutritional requirements for their poultry. So poultry farmers, not that. You can also use your azolla for your dairy, for your dairy cows or goats, and it will increase milk production. And uh, I've also seen farmers using azolla as a substitute of uh, dairy meal. Because basically, what we are feeding our animals on a dairy meal is supplying all the nutrients that are necessary for, maize, for milk production. But here, from our previous screen, allow me to go back to this screen. If you look at this screen critically, you're able to realize that we can get all these nutrients from uh, Azola. So when you have Azola, you will uh, cut down on cost of uh, uh, milk production, and therefore you're able to make more profit from uh, your enterprise, your daily enterprise. You can also feed your goats, as I have said. You can feed your, your ducks, so your birds, your livestock, and maybe somebody can also add another, um, another animal that they've uh, used um, Azola on. So the other thing I also want to mention is Azola, Azola can be produced not necessarily on a pond. You can also use uh, plastic containers like a basin. You can use a, a drum. You can use a drum to produce Azola, especially if you're producing maybe, let's say, chicken, and you don't have enough space that you can uh, 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 put up a, a pond, then you can use containers to produce Azola. So it's, um, it can be done by anyone. And of course, it is convenient for everybody. So you can try Azola. Um, I'm giving you some references that you can uh, look into as you, if you want more information about Azola, I've, I've given you three references. I've given you fish nutrition in aquaculture by Sena. 
I've given you fresh water and aquaculture by Kumara. And there is a video in Access Agriculture in English, Kikuyu and Swahili on uh, growing azola for feeds. And the link is there. I'm sure Ratemo can also uh, put the link on chat so that everyone can access. And therefore, having come this far, it is time for you us now to give you a chance to ask questions so that you can proceed from there. So please ask your questions. I'll be here to, to answer. And I know I'm not alone. We have other people with us, especially those who are joining us in our in our in the Zoom, who will be able to answer some of your questions. So Ratemo, back to you for the question and answer session. Yeah, thank you so much, Grace. And as you can see from her presentation, it was very specific so that we get all the information we can about Azola. And also she has posted her contact information in case the Q&A session ends, the conversation does not stop. If you want to reach her, she has put her contact there. You can just note it somewhere and also the telem contact. At the same time, all the presentation, we are going to post it on our Pelam Kenya website. So after this, you just check it will be there. Now, there is a question from Beatrice. Can mm -hmm. I use a dam liner for a raised pond? Uh-huh. But I can answer that, or can we take two questions? Let me, let me do another one from Percy yeah. Jerry. What she joined late, so apologies from her. So the question is, what are the seeds of Azola for propagation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can take those two, and I look for more questions from uh, people who are online. All right. So maybe before I um, answer, I'm also giving a chance to the expert, experts in our Zoom link, those who are joining us on Zoom, is there, is there anyone who would wish to take a question? Uh, you can just proceed. All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yes, Beatrice, you can use the dam liner for a raised pond. But also, if you're, if you're in a position to use, uh, uh, to use bricks, it will be better. But if you're using a, a, a dam liner for your raised pond, then it is important that you ensure that the walls are supported well. So maybe you can use, I've seen farmers using a bamboo, and of course you can use timber for your, just the way we do our raised uh, fish ponds. So you can do the same. You can use a bamboo to support the walls or timber, and then, line with the dam liner. And of course, make sure that you're using the heavy gauge. It will serve the purpose. So yes, Beatrice, I hope you have answered your question. Uh, for the person who asked about uh, seed propagation, we have people who can uh, supply the seeds, but you can culture your seed. So for example, if you're doing a uh, if, if you, when you get your seeds, you can use your basin or even a, a smaller pond to culture your seed. What happens is you provide enough nutrients and um, uh, ensure that the azola is fully mature. And then you can actually break the ready, the mature azola with your own hands and spread in the bigger pond. And uh, we have people who, who can sell you uh, Azola seeds in every region. I'm sorry, I do not have the contacts right here with me, but of course I can also supply. I do Azola myself, so I can supply. And uh, once you get your first uh, seed, you can always propagate your own seed, especially in a smaller pond. 
that is how I can answer you. Uh, what was her name? I didn't, I did not ask. Jerry. Jerry, yes. Yeah, there's also another question from Michael about where you can purchase uh, Azola. You can reach us, you can see our email, our number. Depending on the location you are, we can direct you to a farmer or someone selling Azola. Because we don't know where you're from, exact location. So please reach out. You can reach Grace or Helen. The numbers are on the screen. And then we will direct you to a uh, a person who is selling the uh, Azola. Yeah, so we have questions on uh, uh, Zoom. I wish to for people to raise their hand and then post their question. On your online, you can speak for your question. So Stephen, are you able to talk so that you post your question? From ADS. Okay, if not, the question is, first of all, he says, thank you for the presentation. So in terms of costs, what is the initial costs? How can the average temperatures be maintained? I think there are several questions in one paragraph, maybe you are not somewhere address. So the first question was, what is the initial costs? How can the average temperatures be maintained? How much should cattle or chicken take per day? And is it mixed with other things? Maybe you can take that and then we go another round of questions. All right, I'm not in the questions. So Michael, the initial cost of production will depend from one area to the other. Let me talk about um, the construction of the pond. So our pond that is, um, uh, four by six and 20 centimeters deep. Depending on the cost of labor, where you come from, can go up to around a thousand. And then of course, a purchase of seeds from 2000 Kenya shillings. Uh, of course, you can use uh, the available nutrient supplies. So with around uh, 3000, you're able to start your your Azola business. So that is why I'm saying the initial cost could be a bit high, especially for the smallholder farmers. And uh, to, for, to address this, we usually encourage farmers, those especially those who are in groups, to work together. They can have a single pond for a start so that um, the other farmers can get seed from that pond. So to cut the cost of production down, you can uh, do this as a group. Uh, on how much poultry can take per day, it will depend on the size of your poultry, of course. Um, and, uh, and, uh, yes. Uh, so this is still Steven, and uh, thank you so much uh, for the response. Um, I'm just following up on uh, that response on what is the initial cost you have mentioned about uh, digging. Uh, the four by six that, uh, yeah, I mean, depending with uh, the area. But then I think you had indicated that uh, apart from digging, there are also um, things that need to be done. I, I, was it uh, that you need to construct it uh, in terms of the sides and all that? Probably if you could just elaborate on that. All right, um, apart from, See, actually, you don't even have to dig. You can raise your pond. And if you're raising, you, you still need um, uh, to line your, the walls of your pond, depending on uh, your preferences and your resources, of course. So those are some of the other costs, costs that you will incur. And also, it is important for you to protect that area where your, your pond is. For example, you can use a shade net to cordon off that area where your pond is. One, it is also for security. For example, if you have uh, young children, for their own safety, it's important to ensure that that area is protected. So those are some of the costs that I'm talking about. Although, as I mentioned, some farmers would prefer to put it uh, along the riverbanks 
So it could be quite some distance from home. So that could be safe. But at the same time, you can actually find wild animals uh, uh, like uh, squirrels in that pond. So it's important that that area is uh, protected. So those are the costs that I'm talking about. So talking about the amount I just mentioned, around 3,000 shillings, I'm looking at um, the simple pond that you've constructed in an area that is, um, that is able to hold water, maybe in a swamp where you will not need uh, a dam liner. So if you're using a dam liner, of course, the cost would go up. It could even go high as 10,000 and more. So it depends on your capacity. So I'm really not going, um, but if you need now the experts, I, I have people who can do this for you at a cost of 15,000. This will uh, include the construction and the seeding of the pond. That is how I can answer Michael. Thank you, thank you, Grace. We have a lot of questions. So I want to give, uh, I think the person raising his hand and just uh, post your question. You have not. Let me, let me answer the last question, Ratemo, from what I already have. So I'm, uh, I was in the process of answering uh, uh, how much poultry can take per day. I okay. said, uh, mm -hmm. depending on the cost, you can actually supply half a kg, or let me call it five to 10% of the other feeds. Because actually, this is rich in uh, nutrients. So you can uh, put five to 10% of the other feeds. Ratemo, proceed. Thank you. Yeah. You can now ask your question. Okay, uh, I'm Martin Odiambo from Kakamega, uh, working for FIPS Africa in a 4WS project that is being sponsored by McKnight Foundation. Under 4WS, our main aim has always been to promote sustainable, effective, environmental friendly, pocket friendly, options that directly speaks to farmers' problems and also adhere to agroecology. So when it comes to fodder, now that we have realized that fodder is always a challenge to most of the farmers, we are suggesting different options whereby we have Azola as one of our options. So uh, currently in Kakamega, we have over 50 ponds. And there are some things that we have been struggling with that maybe I needed some uh, clarification and also some advices. So one, you talked about Azola nutrition. So when we talk about nutrition, we also consider Azola establishment. Now that this is something that is good, helpful to farmers, is there anything that we can add to maybe the normal manure that we are using so that it can fasten the establishment and covering of the pond. Maybe instead of Azola taking 15 days, for instance, it can maybe take like five or 10 days to cover the same pond that it have, could have covered uh, within 15 days. Then uh, again, after harvesting Azola, we need Azola to regrow, then we can harvest again. Is there anything maybe that we can do so as also to fasten the regrowth? For me, as at now, there are some experiments that I'm doing with farmers, uh, trying to check on different uh, products, uh, having uh, combining local knowledge and also the global knowledge by using the global products and also the local available products, just to see which one maybe can uh, help in regrowth and also in establishment. But this is something that you can advise. Number two uh, is on Azola value addition. Let's say I have harvested my Azola today and I would wish it, uh, and I would wish to use it after three months. How can I do the value addition? Number three, you talked about Azola being able maybe to manufacture its own nitrogen. So it does not require much nitrogen. 
do you think there is a way onto how we can embed this uh, into farming in that maybe we can dry like a Zola or even add something on it so that we can also use it as a fertilizer. So that besides feeding animals, besides feed, uh, feeding poultry, we can also use Azola as a fertilizer. Then number four, this is just a concern. Uh, what happens when Azola finds it ways, uh, its way into our ponds or the rivers? And now that Azola is like a, a maybe a water hyacinth like so maybe if it finds its way to our ponds and our rivers, is there any problem? Then lastly, I would wish to share maybe another way that we have been trying to make Azola cost effectively in terms of production and also adoption. We introduced Azola whereby we were using the dam liners. Farmers complained, dam liners are expensive. I did some trials in Kakamega where I have been using the normal construction polythene that goes for 100 shillings per meter. For a pond of five meter by one, the farmer will only need 500 shillings uh, so as uh, uh, to serve as a dam liner. And I've tried it with 50 ponds and it's really working. Farmers, there are some ponds that were constructed last year, December, and as at now, they are still on good conditions. So that is also another way whereby maybe we can advise farmers or research on so that we can see on how we can reduce uh, the construction uh, uh, amount or even the construction cost so that at the end of the day, we promote something that is cost effective and will also make farmers adopt it. Then lastly, when it comes to feeding, how much Azola can a, a dairy animal consume in a day? Having in mind that we also have uh, the feeding challenge whereby maybe you can feed one kg today, then see uh, the production, then ne next time increase, then also see the production. So which is the recommended rate? in terms of quantity that maybe we can feed it to Azola. Thank you, and I'm happy for this session. Thank you for your question. Uh, Grace, you are now right. start Thank spotting. you, Martin. Yes, thank you, Martin, for your, for, for your contribution. First of all, I appreciate the work that you're doing in Kakamega. I think I visited around two farmers in Kagamega, uh, especially the, the, the lower part, the border to Wasingisho County, and I have seen good work happening on that uh, area. Now, let me talk about the nutrition, which was your first question. Uh, of course, I have talked about uh, maybe slurry, but I have also tried using um, the organic uh, biofertilizers and uh, it is working very well. I have used a power flow. I know some of you would understand what power flow is. I'm not going to explain it. It's a fermented biofertilizer. It is working effectively. There is also a, a power flow from, um, from Dr. Mihindo's uh, company, what is the Ratemo? Yes, the power flow is from Effective IPM Association. I'm going to post a, a Facebook tag on the comments. So they supply power flow, which is a biostimulant fertilizer from seaweeds, a very innovative way of uh, generating fertilizer. Let me press you can continue. Yes, so especially after your concern was uh, the uh, regrowth of um, Azola after harvesting. We have tried using power flow. And uh, once we use power flow, we are able to harvest Azola after every one day. Like if we harvest today, we are not harvesting tomorrow, we are harvesting the following day. And the biomass is uh, huge, it's incredible. And the size of the, of the Azola is also bigger. 
the roots are a bit smaller, but the, 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 the biomass is uh, immense. So power flow works. We have tried this. And also, when we were establishing one of our ponds, we also used uh, uh, super magro. We used super magro, but we allowed the pond to stay for at least three to four days. Actually, for three days, we let the pond settle for three days to enable uh, stability or stabilization of all um, the elements in the pond. And then we, we planted and uh, the, the biomass was also beautiful. So I can recommend you people try super magro, farmers to try super magro and uh, power flow. So the two are what I can um, recommend for now. And of course, this is an area that we can do a lot of research on, on this. So I'll mention that. Uh, on value addition, you can dry your solar, your azola using uh, solar dryers, or even farmers, you don't necessarily have to have a solar dryer. Those farmers who have uh, granaries or uh, stores, you can uh, dry your azola in granaries under the shade, at least it should be dried under the shades. And uh, once it's dry, you can grind it to a, a finer powder and keep it in an um, airtight container. Or I have also seen uh, fish farmers mixing, once they're dry, they mix with their other feet and sow in that form, sow together. So you have a number of options you can uh, solar dry or uh, dry in the shade. Uh, the other thing is uh, you talked about uh, nitrogen. Yes, Azola is able to trap nitrogen from the environment. And uh, therefore, Azola is very rich in nitrogen. And as I mentioned before, you can actually use Azola for, to make your teas, your plant teas. So if you ferment, Azola with water for three to for five to seven days, depending on uh, the weather or the climatic condition in your area, you're able to get a very rich uh, foliar feed for your crops, and you mix at a rate of uh, one to two. So if I use uh, Azola, a one kg of uh, Azola. I add uh, two liters of water and ferment for five to seven days. When it is ready, I'm able to use the same um, uh, foliar again at a rate of one to two. So one liter of that, I mix with two liters of water and I spray on my crops and it will function so well. I have also realized that it will also uh, chase away uh, the pests, especially from your vegetables, because of its smell. Once it ferments, it has some, um, I don't know how to explain, some smell that uh, repels on, uh, on pests. So you can do that. You can do that. Uh, you can use it. So we can use it in farming, really. It's a good uh, source of uh, nitrogen. The other concern that you mentioned is on um, uh, Azola being an aquatic plant, what happens when it gets to the rivers. It is uh, important for all of us to note that the fish will always feed on, um, on Azola and other aquatic animals, but we might not be able to contain. But what we've done, with a farmer in a place called um, Nangili, so between Wasingishu and Transwaya, in a pond that we had uh, Azola, we introduced tilapia fish in that pond. And uh, it was a pond of around five by six. And we introduced uh, tilapia in that pond. And uh, within five days, without supplying any other food, Azola was gone. It had been eaten by, uh, by the fish, and we waited to see it 
regrow. It did not. It tried uh, regrowing on the edges, but within a short time, it is not there. So I think um, I am not going to say I have a lot of information about that, but maybe it's a concern for all of us. We need to to think about our way. So that that could be the reason why it is not. In, we do not encourage farmers to put this along the river river banks before we know exactly how to handle this so that it does not become another seaweed, like uh, 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 what I have mentioned a while ago, power flow is uh, made from the seaweed. So actually people are, uh, are uh, helping in cleaning our, our lakes by removing the seaweed and making biofertilizers from it. So maybe that is what I can say really. Martin, I think it's full food for thought for all of us. And we are going to follow up on that. The other thing is on, uh, you've mentioned about the construction cost. Uh, this is interesting that you are able to use um, uh, the normal polythene. Of course, I know the shelf life will be, will be shorter, but at the same time, it will be more convenient for more farmers. So I'm in support of this. We can uh, use uh, the available materials as uh, I have also had a group that is doing a trial that I'm not able to share now because it's still in progress. What they did is they constructed their pond and um, smeared um, the walls with the um, cow dung, Nasema Kuboma, the way we do our houses. That is what they did with their ponds. They did the first smearing, waited for a few days, did another one, waited for some time, and did the final one. And uh, after that, they've uh, put water and uh, planted uh, azola. What we are trying to do with this is to see how loss, the level of loss of water, and this is happening in, uh, in uh, what's in Gishu. So it's quite uh, uh, dry. It's not very, very wet at the moment. The rains are not as we expect them to be. So we are monitoring how we are losing the water in the pond or how it is holding the water. So that is something we are trying. We cannot say for sure it's working. It's something under research. Maybe we can also, you can try something on the other side, but uh, the um, sheet, I think that is okay. We support that. You finally talked about uh, feeding. Uh, somebody had asked about uh, feeding a uh, poultry. No, you've asked about uh, feeding dairy. Farmers have had their own uh, uh, practice. And uh, I've seen farmers feeding their cows with a kg, a dairy cow that produces around 10, uh, 10 kgs of milk per day with a, a kg of azola per day. And uh, the farmer reported that it was, he was able to get at least half a liter of milk increase. So it is work in progress, but I'm, I, I, um, from research, we are told we are supposed to feed at least 10 kgs of Azola, 10% of Azola to the total kg of uh, feed that we feed on our animals. So for example, if your cow takes a, uh, uh, if you're feeding your cow with uh, five kgs of concentrates per day, then 10% of this should be Azola. So we are cutting down on the, on the uh, number of kgs that we are using on our livestock. And also, I have seen farmers who've stopped completely using a dairy meal. Instead, they are substituting dairy meal with Azola and the production is uh, still good. So it is also an area to explore more, but we usually encourage farmers, dairy farmers, to at least use a kg of Azola per day. Thank you, Martin. I hope I've answered your questions. And I think there is so much for us to learn. We can uh, cross learn and share information across Transoia and us. Or not transfer here actually the Kakamega. Maybe another question, Ratemo. Yes, yeah, three questions from Facebook. 
I want to start with Henry Cheriot. What is the optimum temperature for Azola and how can you achieve it? And then, do I give you three questions? Or... Yes. Okay. The, the question in terms of consumption, if mm -hmm. there's too much consumption, especially for livestock, for instance, <laughs> uh, does it cause side effects such as bloating? Mm -hmm. The last one from Kevin, how frequently does a farmer have to add nutrients to the pond? Mm -hmm. And take those three. Yes. So let me start with the, with the first one that I, uh, I have also seen people inbox me with the same excessive consumption of Azola. And I want to indicate very clearly that Azola is easily digestible. It is easily digestible. And because the cow is taking everything, including the roots, it is highly fibrous as well. So bloating has not been reported um, as a case as at now, but also it is a caution because anytime we feed our livestock on um, uh, wet, um, highly, when the, the moisture content is high on any, any feed, bloating is always a concern. That is why it is advisable that before you even feed your Zola, if you're feeding them directly to your, your livestock, upon harvesting, you clean them and uh, you let it, uh, you do not feed immediately to your livestock. You let it uh, wilt a little bit, probably under the shade. If you are feeding them in the evening, you harvest them in the morning. It will have lost a bit of moisture, but at the same time, the nutrients level is still very high. So uh, we don't have to wait until the cows bloat for us to be to, to look at this as a concern. So anytime the moisture content is high on any feed, it is a concern for livestock. So I mean, I'm encouraging our farmers, you can do value addition. That is, uh, you can dry them and then feed the, the, the cows on or wait, let it settle for some time before you can feed uh, your, uh, your animals. The other question is on um, frequency of uh, uh, supplying nutrients to the pond. I said three to four weeks, but it will depend on your level of production. If your level of production is high, then you can Supply, if it's not very high, you can even do it once um, a month. So it will depend uh, uh, for, for the person who was asking that. I'm sorry, I did not pick your name. And finally, the question that was asked by uh, Henry on optimum temperatures for Azola. I think I mentioned this as uh, we were starting, but at the same time, we usually say, at least let it have a 30% of sunlight. That is one. And also I mentioned 20, 20 to 25 to 30 degrees centigrade is uh, still okay for, for Azola. So it is manageable, but what our concern was when we discussed this was uh, uh, during the very cold seasons like now, currently I am in, uh, I am at, I'm in Molo uh, for farmers training under KCOA with mayor, and the place is very cold, it's very cold. So when the temperatures are very low, it might be very difficult for us to manage the temperatures. But again, look at the ponds that have been, uh, like the one I shared on my presentation, there was a photo where a farmer is using a, a black dam liner can you think about it when the sun is very hot? It will also, the, so the temperatures will keep fluctuating, but anywhere around that figure is still good. Ratemo? Yes, thank you. I see a hand from Martin. I don't know 
if we give him a chance to ask and then. Okay, uh, thank, uh, thank you very much. Just to share maybe a concern and also maybe inquire from you on mm -hmm. pest and diseases. I have been having challenges with frogs whereby frogs, are, uh, they find their way into the uh, Azola pond, then they eat the... I think I lost Martin. Yeah, same to me. Let me internet. Martin, oh. hello yes, Martin, yes. we lost you, yes. please repeat. Okay, I'm sorry I was interrupted by a call. So uh, farmers have been having challenges with frogs, whereby frogs find their way into the pond. Then the frogs eat the roots and azona dries. So I've been encouraging my farmers to use old mosquito nets. They surround the pond with the old mosquito nets. And that one uh, has been helping them to prevent frogs from getting into the pond. So it has worked. So I just wanted maybe to confirm if maybe there is a way that you have researched on that can also help to keep away frogs. I think we are doing exactly what you're doing, Martin. Other farmers uh, are using uh, shed nets, others uh, old mosquito nets. So, so far, we do not have any other strategy unless anyone in uh, following us online or uh, in Zoom can give us their input. But for us, we are also using the same old mosquito nets and shed nets to cordon off the area. All yes, right, sir. thank you. Then a question from yes. Kevin, I think a follow-up question in terms yes. of uh, temperatures. So in areas where there's high temperatures, for instance, Marigat or Siaya, how would we control the temperatures? Thank you. Uh, on places where the temperatures are very high, then what we need to do is to increase on the shade. We can reduce, we can increase on the shading so that we are able to bring down, down the temperatures. I have also seen other farmers covering their ponds with the, with the, um, with the shade nets, complete co completely covering the pond. And I think that is something that was also happening in one of the photos that uh, Ratemo you are in, you find a farmer covering the entire pond. So, that is why I mentioned that that is one of the setbacks of um, Azola production. But basically, anywhere between 32 from actually from 28 to 32 will not be very bad. And it is uh, and as slow as 23, you can still uh, you can still produce Azola. So it's quite uh, attainable. So we can play around with the shading. Thank you. Unless somebody has something else. And uh, you can also uh, be adding fresh water regularly, but that will mean regular or uh, uh, frequent nutrient supply in the pond. Because if you bring in fresh water, the, that fresh water will automatically bring down the temperatures of the water in the pond. But at the same time, we might be required to increase the level of uh, nutrient supply. I hope I've answered, uh, Kevin. Yes, uh, another question, a follow-up. So mm -hmm. Kevin Kipchichir, he yes. says, on my final question, are there any diseases that affect Azola production? So, so far, I am not going to say we've struggled with any diseases. What we've realized is uh, the pests, as uh, my brother Martin has said, like frogs. And also the other problem would be excessive uh, sunlight that will cause um, our azola to turn brownish. And in the process, 
lose our we, we, we lose our nutrients. And of course, it will also affect the palatability of uh, Azola because when it turns brownish, it is a bit tougher. So, so far, maybe I can ask Martin to tell us if they are struggling with any diseases from their end. Okay, uh, for our case, uh, we haven't experienced any disease. What we are now working on is maybe acidity, when maybe there is ice acid in the water, but that is something that we are still working on. So maybe I can be able uh, to share it later after we are done with the trial. But as of now, we have only faced challenges with frogs and snakes. In fact, mm -hmm. the green snakes, in fact, the green snakes. So for the green snakes, what I'm currently trying is that I advise my farmers to suspend uh, the fresh cow dung, maybe in a sack into mm -hmm. the pond, so as mm -hmm. to see if it will help maybe uh, chase away the snake. So that is something that I'm also still working on. Yes, and also for the snakes, we've also had to, when you're fencing or cordoning off the area with the old um, mosquito nets or uh, the shed nets, you can uh, dig some trench and make sure that the net starts from the trench. Like you're able to, from the ground level, you, it is clearly covered that nothing can, can, can pass through. That is what you are also trying to do for the snakes. And uh, somebody mentioned about uh, use of uh, tephrosia like you can plant a uh, tephrosia at the corners of uh, the cordon areas because uh, the smell is not friendly for the snakes. I have not tried this. This is what I have um, had and I read somewhere, but I've not tried myself. So maybe that is something we can try. Back to you, Ratemo. Yes, there's a question from Agustin Mwana. How mm -hmm. is the market for Azola? Maybe for those who are doing it for business. Yes, Agustin. This is a business niche for any serious uh, business person, and especially for our young people. I remember last year when you were, not last year, two years, when you were training uh, farmers on under this program, KCW, and uh, we were training them on uh, on Bokashi. We have uh, young people who went ahead to do it commercial and are packaging Bokashi and selling. This is also an opportunity for the young people for business. You can do this, dry them and sell. Actually, we have those farmers who, who are in urban areas but do livestock. So there is an opportunity for business. That is what I can say. Because of course, when I tried, uh, when I started uh, doing Bokash, doing uh, Azola, I have had farmers coming to ask if they can buy from me. And of course, I've not done it large scale, but I was looking at it as an opportunity. So anywhere we have uh, dairy farmers, it's not everybody who will go to production. So this is an opportunity. I think someone can uh, run with this idea. Ratemo. Thank you. Maybe Martin, you can tell us, are you selling uh, Azola in Kakamega or is it just for the uh, local production? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Maybe before I respond to your question, uh, somebody talked about Tephrosia and maybe just maybe uh, to come in, you see Tephrosia, we have different varieties. And uh, I realized that there are some varieties that are not much effective when it comes maybe to using them to control maybe moles. So I also think that maybe as we try a, with uh, Tephrosia, there's this variety called Buisa, Buisa variety. For me, uh, it's a effective. Uh, and maybe somebody who wants to try Azola can try this variety. 
because I've also tried the other varieties, but I don't see them much effective. So uh, for the Tafrosia, we can try Buisa variety. Then uh, again, you talked about uh, top dressing, whereby you talked about uh, the power flow, the super, super muggle, but you see that's global knowledge. And we are trying to make this thing be something that it's easily adoptable. So maybe I could advise that we also try top dressing with these local available materials. For instance, uh, I have been using manure, the normal animal manure, but uh, I tried it with the Bokashi manure. Bokashi is also an organic manure that becomes ready within 14 days. And uh, it's made from uh, different things, but it tries to embrace the NPK formula. So you will find that most of these nutrients that are being required by plants uh, are in Bokashi. So I tried with Bokashi and it is really working good. I realized that it uh, with manure, it takes like uh, two weeks to fill a pond of uh, five meter by one, but with Bokashi, it can even take like 10 days. So that is something that also we can also work on. Then maybe I, a question that I'm also having is that uh, are we having different varieties? And if we are having different varieties of Azola, is there a variety that can be good in terms of biomass production? So that maybe we can advise farmers that for good biomass production, then you can try this variety. Thank you. Then there is a question that you asked, maybe if uh, you can uh, ask it again. Yes. The question was about market. Since you mentioned okay, you are doing Azola on large scale, are you selling? How much are you selling? Is there an opportunity for the youth? Yeah. Good. Uh, for now, I'm still working on, okay, uh, my aim is that each and every home to have Azola. Now that in each and every home, you will find that there are chicken, uh, there are dairy animals. So as of now, I'm trying to promote establishment, but we have farmers who have been selling, but they have been selling as planting material. For instance, I have some farmers who sell the planting material, that's one kg at 500 shillings. So they sell one, uh, hundred, uh, one kg at 500 shillings, though it is not sustainable because after I have bought uh, the one kg, I go and establish my pond. So next time I may not come back. So there is market but for a farmer who wants to establish it. But uh, maybe for selling, uh, for a farmer who is going to feed, uh, there might, uh, there is not that much market demand because each and every farmer, once you feed, you see it's good. The next time you buy, then you establish your pond. So there is market, but to somebody who is doing it uh, 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 and selling it as a seed. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Maybe Ratemo, I can answer the question on uh, varieties. Uh, yeah, we, have, uh, we have so many, around eight varieties of um, Azola, but the common one that we do in Kenya is uh, Azola pinata and Azola nilotica. Those are the, the common ones, but the one that, um, does so well is a uh, pinata according to our experience. So actually I have tried uh, Nilotica and pinata and I uh, recommend pinata. But the varieties are so many. We have Mexicana, Carolina, there are so many. So pinata for me, I don't know what variety the Western team are trying, but pinata for us is working very well for biomass. I have a question, just mine, not from yes. the participants. Now, in terms of those varieties, do they like have a different color or the way they look, or they just look the same, but maybe the genome is, uh, I don't know. I'm just trying to 
see how do I differentiate those varieties? Is it color, is it texture, or something like that? Actually, the varieties are, uh, are different according to so many things. Like for us, the, the pinata is a ret rectangular in, uh, in shape. So you can also differentiate them from their structures. Others are um, uh, rectangular, others are a bit uh, circular, and also the color. Others are uh, deep green, do I call it deep or dark green? Others are a bit lighter. And what I don't know, I don't know about their nutritional value. I have not tried, but the book says the nutritional value is also different. But the one that is balanced is a uh, pinata, as I have said. Uh, thank you for the clarification. I hope I also had that people who never got some of that question. Now, from Facebook, I don't see uh, questions. So mm -hmm. let me give people like two minutes if you have any questions in this post. And then from the people on Zoom, you're too silent. You have a question, you have any comment you want to share. Or like read out your name and you share something you've learned. Uh, Terry, yes, are you able to yes. unmute? Yes, we can do that, Ratema. We have around 10 minutes so they can say something before we can wind up. Yes, yes. We have Anthony. Anthony, please say something. You have a question, a comment, maybe something of lunch you never knew. Uh, good morning, team. Thank you. Um, I've learned quite a great deal of Azola. I've been um, doing my own research on Azola. The, I've tried it, but I've not been successful. I think for me, I should be able and uh, do something. Um, my main area of focus is the area of the repellent for snake. I'll just appreciate if it can be, at least I can be highlighted more on about the repellent of the snakes around the, the Azola pond. And this also can also help in the, those practicing fish farming. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Grace, do you want to respond on the snakes? Uh, my response will be the same, what you've said before. So far, what we are, we are doing is um, uh, using the uh, cordoning of the area using uh, old uh, mosquito nets or uh, shade nets. And as I mentioned, somebody talked about the frosha, of which our brother has uh, uh, alluded to the Buesa variety as um, the better one. So maybe we can all try this. I will try myself and maybe give a feedback later so we can try um chefrosha meanwhile and uh of course he mentioned martin also mentioned suspension of uh cow dung in a sack in that pond maybe those are the strategies we are using for now all right and a question from china so mm -hmm. following from kakamega is it okay to wilt Azola before feeding a livestock? To wilt before uh, feeding the livestock? Yes, I said that it is uh, for, for, the, for us to lose a bit of moisture, we can do that, but under the shade, not directly. I know we tell farmers to, to do the same for napier grass, for example, and you find farmers cutting their napier grass and leaving them uh, to wilt a bit in direct sunlight. It is not recommendable. So I'm, I'm asking that uh, if you need to wilt, do it under the shade. All right, there's no more question from, from Facebook, but I see we have uh, participants from Tarakaniki, from Nyando Crep, we have from Meru, we have from Kakamega, from Eldore, from Zambia, from Zimbabwe, from Caritas Nyahururu. Basically, we have participants from all over the world. 
including Zambia and Zimbabwe. So thank you for joining. If you have any questions, this is the time before we close. We also have participants on Zoom. So I want to give them a chance. We have Pamela from Uganda. Are you able to share anything maybe you've learned or you have a question? Please unmute and share. Amela, are you able to unmute? All right, if not, we have Kevin, no, I see he doesn't have audio. So Beth or Mai, are you able to? Beth. I mean, a practical, I don't know if uh, I would want to talk, but uh, I want to thank everyone for following, and uh, I believe they have learned. And uh, I want to thank uh, KCOA for organizing for this uh, this uh, training. And I know most people are interested to learn about Azola. So thank you, Grace. And Inje. Grace was part of our training. We are having a farmer level training outside. So <laughs> we are waiting for her outside. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we are almost finishing. So if there is no question, um, I wish to request for everyone who is online to just put their camera on so that people can see who you are. Maybe Grace, you can stop sharing so that our screen is big. And then we take a photo. Yeah. Hi, Martin. <laughs> Yeah. So thank you everyone for joining. And uh, this webinar was organized by Phelan Kenya through the KCOA project. And we have several plans every month for these webinars. So tune in to our social media, we'll be posting there. Yeah, so Grace, maybe you can share your parting shots to everyone. All right, thank you, Ratemo for co-facilitating. It has been a very interactive uh, session. I'm so happy to have been uh, in this session and I've met people whom we can uh, share research, we can work together, people like uh, Martin and the rest. Uh, it was a pleasure having all of you here. And as I said before, I'm here to share what I, I have learned and also learn from you people. And that is exactly what has happened. I'm so humble. I, turn, I also take this opportunity to appreciate um, KCOA for giving us an opportunity to reach out to our farmers. And uh, as you realize, we are not exactly sharing what the books say. We are, best, we are mostly sharing what farmers have tried and are found to be working so that the other farmers can also be encouraged that it is working. Thank you very much. I look forward to some other time. We're doing the same thing and also probably meeting with uh, some of you to progress what we've started. Thank you, Ratemo. So thank you. We will say bye to everyone and see you next time. Let me